Today's lecture is basically going to show you that a lot of the rules that you learned in sophomore organic chemistry, like the n plus 1 rule, are simplifications. And we'll be seeing a lot of examples that look really weird because I want to show you where these simplifications break down. And then next time, we'll get to more sort of the typical rules of splitting. All right, so as I said, I wanted to begin with this notion of magnetic equivalence. And let me begin with a definition. We'll say magnetic equivalence. And let's say that two protons or nuclei In other words, we're normally we're talking about proton NMR, but of course it could be fluorines or phosphoruses or whatever, are magnetically equivalent if they are chemically equivalent. And remember, two nuclei that were chemically equivalent were nuclei that were interchangeable by a symmetry operation or a rapid process like rotation about a bond. So we saw lots of examples of chemically equivalent nuclei by symmetry. And then we saw how when you have, for example, a chiral center, methylene group is no longer chemically equivalent. So chemically equivalent, so they're a subset of chemically equivalent. and they have the same geometrical relationship to all other nuclei in the spin system. And so this brings up one other, one other concept, and that's the question of what is a spin system. And a spin system is just a complete set and I'll underline complete, meaning all of the nuclei. So a complete set of nuclei in which members are coupled. All right, this is, let's start with the easy idea, the spin system. And let's just do this by, by example. So for example, if we have ethyl propyl ether, CH3, CH2, O, CH2, CH2, CH3, we have in the molecule two spin systems. We have one spin system comprising the ethyl group. and another spin system comprising the propyl group. So in other words, the ethyl group is a set of nuclei. Obviously, we're talking about the protons, since for all intents and purposes, there are no C13s in this fragment. 
So we have these hydrogens and these hydrogens, and at least one member is coupled to every other member. They make up a set together. In the propyl group, we have the methyl group, the methylene group, and the other methylene group, and there's coupling among them. In other words, the CH3 is coupled to the CH2, the hydrogens of the CH2 are coupled to each other, the hydrogens of the CH3 are you know, coupled, but that doesn't count. The hydrogens of the CH2 are coupled to the next CH2. And what's important, so each of these is complete, meaning it takes in all the coupled nuclei. What's important is we don't have coupling between the ethyl spin system and the propyl spin system. So they constitute two separate sets. So we can consider the ethyl, we can consider the propyl, and there's no interaction between them. Let's try another example. Let's take acetylphenylalanine and we'll take the methyl, the mid. So what are the spin systems in this molecule? So you have the two methyls on the end, and the benzyl group. Okay, for all intents and purposes, the benzylic protons are not coupled to the phenyl. So what would you do for the spin system here? Separately, so I'm going to revise this. Okay, so we have the phenyl. That's going to be one spin system. What do we do here in the middle? Alpha and beta. What about the NH? Now we saw an example where I said you have it in D2O and you exchange, so it's deuterium there, which although it has a little spin for all intents and purposes, you can discount. But what about this NH? Is that going to be J coupled? Remember, amides are different than alcohols. Alcohols exchange Amides, and remember I said alcohols can exchange or cannot. Amides on the laboratory time scale, if I throw them in D2O, will exchange, but on the NMR time scale, that NH stays there and we're not doing this in D2O. So what should I do with this middle part of the molecule? So that all becomes a spin system. And then what about the very end of the molecule? Okay, good. So these guys interact. Now I'll tell you right now, so we have four spin systems in the molecule. We have the methyl group, we have the NH, the alpha, and the beta protons, and we have the phenyl group and then we have, the, um, we have the methylamide group. So four spin systems in the molecule. We can look at each of these separately. I'll tell you there's a minuscule, like uh, indetectably small, and I'll show you how to see it if you squint right later on, coupling between these hydrogens and the benzyl group. Uh, uh, but for all intents and purposes, you can say that the phenyl group is not coupled over here. 
So for all intents and purposes, we have this is an isolated spin system, the phenyl group, the alpha, beta, and NH, the methyl, and the methylamide. Other thoughts? All right. Ah. Yeah. By splitting each other? Yeah. Yeah. And so in chloroform solution, in D2O, these would eventually wash out. But in chloroform solution, what we'd see for this NH is a doublet. It would be a little bit broad. This one is going to have three coupling partners in chloroform solution where this hasn't exchanged, or in DMSO. So we'd see either a doublet of doublet of doublets, or a triplet of doublets, or a doublet of triplets. And we'll talk more about that if, if you're not familiar with those terms. This NH would appear as a quartet. And chances are it would be broadened out a little bit. Remember I mentioned this nitrogen quadrupolar coupling? So a couple of ways this can appear. So it can appear as a 1 to 3 to, three to 1 quartet slightly broadened. It can appear, just due to this nitrogen quadrupolar broadening, as an envelope that encompasses the whole thing. Or it can appear as something where if you don't see the wings of the quartet and you just see a little dip, you might say, oh, it looks like a doublet to me. So depending on the quadrupolar broadening from the nitrogen, this methyl group, in turn, is not going to have significant quadrupolar effects. It's going to be split into a nice doublet. So this will be a quartet or broad quartet or something that looks like a singlet if it's very broadened, the methyl group will be a doublet. All right, let's now tackle this, this notion of the same geometrical relationship. So let's, let's look at this molecule. Let's take 2,6-dichloro-1-terfbutylbenzene. So as far as chemical equivalence goes, we have two types of protons. We have the proton that's para to the tert-butyl group and the proton that's meta to the tert-butyl group. So these three constitute a spin system. Chlorines don't count. They're quadrupolar nuclei and essentially not, not spin active. The tert-butyl group is magnetically isolated. It's its own spin system. So we look at this and we say, all right, we have two protons that are the same as far as chemical equivalence. They're interchangeable by a symmetry operation. And now we ask this geometrical question. Do they have the same relationship to all other nuclei in the spin system? And this hydrogen says, oh, look, I'm ortho to this hydrogen. And this hydrogen says, oh, look, I'm ortho to it also. So these two are magnetically equivalent. as well as chemically equivalent. Now, there's a way of naming systems where you have different types of protons. And we'll give a different letter to each type of non-chemically equivalent proton. So for example, we'll use letters like A, and B, and C, and M, and X, and Y if you need to. And the general idea is if the protons are close in chemical shift, 
we'll use letters that are right next to each other in the alphabet, A's and B's and C's. If they're far apart in chemical shift, we'll use letters that are far apart in the alphabet, letters like A's and X or A and M and X. So depending on whether these protons are close in chemical shift to the center proton or whether they're far in chemical shift, We'll either call this an A to B spin system or an A to X spin system. Now technically, only ones where they're far apart are truly first order. But even if they're close, there are some very regular patterns that you can see. If they're far apart in chemical shift, and by far apart, what I mean is the separation of the peak centers in Hertz is many, many times the coupling constant. So like a typical ortho coupling constant is about 7 Hertz. So if the peaks are far apart, like 10 times as far apart, like 70 Hertz or 100 Hertz or 200 Hertz apart, then they will end up being A's and X's. Now remember, at 500 ppm, 1 ppm is 500 hertz. So in other words, if these guys are about 2 tenths of a ppm apart, you know, 3 tenths of a ppm apart, we would call this an A to X spin system. And what we'd expect would be to see a doublet for the two on the outside because they're being split by the one in the middle. And a triplet, and so I'll just draw a little squiggly to indicate these are far apart in the spectrum. And a triplet like so for the center hydrogen. And I guess technically the triplet would be shorter than the doublet, so I'll make the doublet a little bigger. If they're close together, and I'm going to actually start in just a moment with the archetypical AB system. If they're closer together, what you will see, so if it is indeed A to B, what you'll see is a slight tenting inward depending on how far. In other words, the lines of the doublet, instead of being equal in height, will become unequal in height with the bigger line toward its J coupling partner. And the lines of the triplet will be similarly distorted so that the inner line is a little bigger than the outer line. I always like to think of these as sort of tenting in toward each other. And that would be what it would look like as an AB, A2B system. Let's try another example. And I'll take difluoromethane. Now remember, fluorine is spin active, spin of a half. Its magnetogyric ratio is about 90% of that of a proton. So it shows up a million miles away. Whereas your protons are resonating at 500 megahertz, your fluorine is resonating at 470 or 460 megahertz. So they are far, far, far away from each other but they're J-coupled to each other. So collectively, the hydrogens and the fluorines constitute a spin, set, a spin system. If I want to remember my geometry, because we're going to ask what type of spin system it is, it's a tetrahedral molecule. So the geometrical relationship of this hydrogen to the fluorine is the same as the geometrical relationship of this hydrogen to the fluorine. In other words, we would call this spin system an A2, X2 spin system. We have two hydrogens that are chemically equivalent. They're interchangeable by a symmetry operation. 
and two fluorines that are chemically equivalent, they're interchangeable by a symmetry operation, reflection. And the hydrogens, if you test, everyone has the same geometrical relationship to all other nuclei in the spin system. So this is an A2X2 spin system. No, it's just that they're far away. As I said, if these guys are more than a few tenths of a ppm away, we would call this x in this case. And if there were two of them in some circumstances, we'd call them x2. So if you look at the H1 NMR spectrum or the F1 NMR, you would expect the H1 NMR spectrum to show up as a triplet. Now, I want to contrast this example with another example. Difluoroethylene. How would we characterize that spin system? What? A, B, X, Y. OK, we've, let's start with this issue of chemical equivalence here. So are the two hydrogens chemically equivalent to each other? OK, so these guys are chemically equivalent. And the two fluorines? Yeah, OK chemically equivalent. All right, so we're going to use the same letter, but we have a problem now. They're not magnetically equivalent. So we need to introduce another term. When we have hydrogens that are chemically equivalent, but not magnetically equivalent, we'll use, or nuclei in general, we'll use primes. So what we'll do is we'll call this an A, A prime, X, X prime spin system. And the big difference is that while a system that's an A2 X2 system is first order, and even these types of systems I'll call pseudo first order. This is a spin system that is distinctly not first order. And I want to show you the difference between them. OK, so on the top I have, and these are very old spectra. These are spectra from a book that were taken at 60 megahertz, so they're probably from the 1960s. They're taken on a CW instrument. CW instruments are non-Fourier transform instruments, not used anymore. But these little wiggles are just artifacts of it being a CW instrument, so don't worry about that. But the main thing here 
is the difluoromethane, these are proton spectra, is exactly what you would expect. It's a triplet. The difluoroethylene you look at and you say, what's going on? There is no simple description of this, this pattern. This type of pattern can be calculated. Indeed, our NMR spectrometers have software that will calculate it. It can be calculated by computer program, by back of the envelope calculations for simple systems, but basically defies a simple description. Why are those hydrogens spinning? Why are the hydrogen, the, which one? <laughs> Well, here, but it's not the hydrogens. Here, it's the fluorines are splitting the hydrogens. So the difluoromethane is a triplet because the two hydrogens are split by the two fluorines. In the case of the difluoroethylene, the problem is the adage that we use that hydrogens that are the same don't split each other really replies most rigorously to hydrogens that are magnetically equivalent. But hydrogens that are chemically equivalent but not magnetically equivalent kind of sort of do. There are many circumstances where, for all intents and purposes, you don't see any effect. And these are cases that I'll call pseudo first order cases. And what I want to show you today is how all the stuff that we learn in sophomore chemistry for coupling really doesn't rigorously apply to lots and lots of common systems. Now, the first thought when you look at this is, okay, well, this is, this is, um, you know, this is difluoroethylene. It's uh, not a common system. So let's take a common system. And it's one that you're going to see in the course of your graduate career, most likely. So this is dioctyl phthalate. It's commonly a plastic, used as a plasticizer in all sorts of plastics. If you go to the store and you buy yourself a water bottle and it says phthalate free, that's probably saying, or you see plastics listed as phthalate free, that's saying it doesn't have this plasticizer, this compound added, this oily compound to make plastics pliable. Tigon tubing is great with water. However, because it contains dioctyl phthalate, if you use it on your manifold, methylene chloride and THF vapor will dissolve into the Tigon dissolve into the dioctyl phthalate, dilute it, and it will dribble into your reaction flask. And when you work your spectrum up, you'll see the spectrum. When you work your compound up, you'll see a spectrum for this. And you'll say, what the heck? What's going on? Now let's take a look at the molecule and figure out what sort of spin system it is. So we have the octal groups, which are separate, and we have the benzene. Groups. How do we characterize the benzene here? A A prime B B prime. Indeed, or if they're far apart in chemical shift, A A prime. X, X prime. So in other words, if these guys are within uh, two tenths of a ppm of each other with typical couplings, you might call it AA prime BB prime if they're more than a couple of tenths of a ppm apart. You'd probably call it AA prime X, X prime. And what that says is your rules of simple coupling may not apply here. And so many a graduate student has taken their reaction mixture and gone and seen the following pattern in it 
and come to their advisor or their group mates and said, what the heck is going on? This is diactyl phthalate. And again, it defies a simple description. This is an AA prime, XX prime system. And it doesn't matter how high a field you go to, the spectrum of diactyl phthalate is going to look like hell. The only difference as we change field strength is you see how this line, these lines on the inside are a little bigger than these lines on the outside. If we went to a lower field spectrometer, they'd be a little more unequal. If we went to a higher field spectrometer, they'd be a little bit more equal. But no matter what, the spectrum of diactyl phthalate is going to look like that. And that should freak you out just a little bit because it says all that stuff you learned in sophomore chemistry kind of sort of applies, but kind of sort of doesn't. Nothing. So the neoprene is great for your manifold. The one that's even better, so that has more air, um, is more permeable to air, and so it's okay. The one that's really good is butyl rubber, which, or I think it's a nitrile, I think it's a, a butyl nitrile copolymer. Anyway, that's particularly good for manifold lines, but stay away from Tigon. Tigon is meant for aqueous solutions. All right, well, now that I've messed with you a little bit, for your own good. Really, it's for your own good. <laughs> now that I've messed with you for a little bit, let's, let's take a look and see when the rules of sophomore chemistry apply and when they, when they don't, don't necessarily apply rigorously, and let's play with the implications of this. All right, so if I look at, if I look at chloroethane, now, my first thought, and I'll do a Newman projection on it. My first thought is, wait a second, well, the methyl group, we talk about geometrical relationships, and this is confusing because this hydrogen is power to this hydrogen, and this hydrogen is ortho to these hydrogens, but of course, there's rapid rotation, so let's see what happens. So remember, I said rapid processes can equal things out. So we'll call these hydrogens one, two, three, and we'll call these guys four and five. And I'll just imagine a series of rotations. And so you have three equal rotamers. And although H5 is anti to H2 in the first rotamer, we have this second equal rotamer. They're all equivalent. They're all equally populated, where H2 is ghost to H5, and H1 is anti to H5, and this third where H3 is anti. So in the end, it all evens out. And if we want to describe this spin system, how would we describe it then? And which, take a, take a guess, we've talked about the chemical shifts of dichloroethane. AX, and what specifically would we use for numbers? How many hydrogens are there in the methyl group? Three. So what sort of spin system do we It's an A3X2 spin system. And all of these spin systems where there are no primes are truly first order. And while the Bs will, when you get things that are close, it'll deviate from first order. But if they're on top of each other, it gets really messy. But if they're a little bit separated, you basically can call it an AB type of system. All of these spin systems are first order. What do you mean by first order? 
First order means those simple rules of coupling, count up number of different types of neighbors, work out perfectly. So an A2, X2 spin system you can trust is going to give you a triplet and another triplet. In the case of difluoromethane, the trip, other triplet is at 460 megahertz, whereas one triplet's at 500 megahertz, but you get two pure triplets. And in the case of here, we expect a triplet and a quartet and everything's hunky-dory. Now, let's take a look at a different compound. I'll take a look at bromochloromethane, and we're going to do the same thing. I'll Newman project. I'll put the chlorine on the back and the bromine on the front. We'll call it H1. H2 and call these H3 and H4. And I'm just going to imagine the rotomers. So we have two gauche rotomers. And one anti-rotomer. So we could consider the gauche rotomers as a pair, but they're separate from the anti-rotomer. All of them, of course, are interconverting. But let's just look at the anti-rotomer for now, because the anti-rotomer isn't equivalent to the two gauche rotomers. And you'll see the conundrum that we end up with. See, the problem we end up with in the anti-rotomer, and the, in this here you can say, well, H1 and H2, all right, here's one. One is gauche, and then the other gets to be gauche. So you can say, let's consider them as a pair. Here we say, OK, well, the bromine's anti. These two, fine, they have the same relationship. They're interchangeable by symmetry, so H1 and H2 are symmetrical. H3 and H4 are symmetrical. But the problem, particular to the anti-rotomer, is that when you apply this test and say, what's their geometrical relationship, it's different. And so you look at the anti-rotomer, and you say, this is going to be an AA prime X, X prime, or A, A prime, B, B prime spin system. And the problem is, this is that situation that's truly not first order. Now, the good news on this is most of the time, and I've just given you some of the ugliest examples, most of the time, non-first order systems can be approximated as first order systems. In other words, you ask your sophomores what this spectrum should look like, and they'll say, oh, well, they told me the n plus 1 rule. It should be a triplet and a triplet. And that's largely true, but I'm going to show you cases that break down from that. Now, I want to show you the sort of breakdown from, from non-first order to, um, uh, let's call it pseudo-first order. So in other words, if we take a simple AB system or a simple AX system, Let's say I do bromine, bromine, chlorine, chlorine. So this is a simple AX system if they're far apart. You'd see a doublet 
and a doublet. And again, I'll draw a break to indicate that they're far apart. And if they're close to, closer together, we see what's called an AB pattern. where the two tent into each other. And if they're very close, you'll see an AB pattern with the inner lines very big. And if they're really close, you might even mistake it for a quartet. It's not. It's an AB pattern. Anyway, so most of the time you can get away approximating non-first order systems as sort of pseudo-first order systems. In other words, often non-first order systems will show behavior that's very much like you would expect with just the notion that inner lines may become a little bit bigger. But as we saw in our example with dioctyl phthalate, you can have some very, very big deviations. And so what I want to do now is show you really a catalog of typical deviations because once you see them and once you see when they come up, I think you'll be much less freaked out by things that occur. So the scary thing about the diagram that I made on the right-hand board is any time you have a methylene chain, technically it is not first order. Every pair of methylenes, every methylene, the pair of hydrogens, technically they are <coughs> chemically equivalent but not magnetically equivalent. Of course, if there's a stereocenter in the molecule, they're not chemically equivalent. Then it's like an A2, uh, an ABX system. But in the case of just a plain methylene chain without a stereocenter, they are chemically equivalent, but not magnetically equivalent. Normally, you can get away and you say, OK, they taught me as a sophomore the n plus 1 rule. I expect to see a triplet. Normally, it works pretty well. I'm going to show you some cases where we see some very, very big deviations. And I want to show you where these things come up. So this is, these are two different molecules that I've worked with. One of these has a propyl chain connecting an azulene, a very bulky group to a phenyl group. And so you look at the protons on this chain and you say, OK, they all look, this methylene, that looks kind of reasonable, looks like a triplet. You could call it an apparent triplet if you liked. But the one that's right next to the azulene, this very, very bulky group, really ends up looking very, very funny. You see this pattern that has, well, it kind of looks like a triplet, except in the center, it's further split. And the one over here in the middle also looks a little funny. It doesn't look quite like a quintet. See, the thing is, with the CH2 chains, if you've got a mix of anti and gauche conformers, and you've got you know, some anti but also some gauche, Basically, it averages out enough that it behaves like a first order system. It behaves like you were taught it should in sophomore chemistry. However, if it's heavily biased toward the anti-conformer, then just as we saw in dioctyl phthalate, this really funny splitting, you see the same thing. And this group is very bulky here. So in other words, when you're looking at this, you have the azulene group, and then you have the hydrogens, and then it is almost completely locked in the anti 
confirmer. And so you really, really end up seeing this. So this ends up being an A, A prime, M, M prime, X, X prime spin system. That's what it technically is. So technically it's non-first order, but we get that effect full force over here. And you'll notice these types of patterns come up again and again. So here's a very different compound where you still have a tripropyl ch uh, trimethylene chain, but now your bulky group is this TMS group. And the hydrogen that's next to your bulky TMS group, again, gives this exact same pattern. Completely different molecule, but exact same pattern of non-first order behavior. I would just call this peak a multiplet. So I would call all of these multiplets, and I would simply list their range. I guess I'd call this guy an apparent triplet. So we, we don't need to explain why it splits like that. We just need to know that it doesn't split. Exactly. I mean, we have to understand this is a non-first order system, and that normally we can get, often we can get away describing non-first order systems as first order, but you really can't always. Let me show you some other non-first order behavior. So, okay, so most of the time, take bromopropane, another molecule with a chain in it. And remember, most of the time, you can get away describing things as first order. So you look at your bromopropane and you'd say, oh, that looks pretty good. You have a triplet, you have a sextet, you have a triplet. Beautiful. Just what you would expect from sophomore chemistry. Now, another sort of breakdown that occurs is when protons end up lumped on top of each other, even when they're not chemically equivalent. So you go from bromopropane, which has a beautiful triplet, to bromobutane, and you say, OK, that still has a beautiful triplet. We see all of our resonances disperse. You go to bromopentane. And now, these two protons, the protons at the beta and gamma position, are starting to get very close to each other. And your triplet just starts to look a little funny. You can already see there's some tenting in there. That's just your AB behavior. That's, that's perfectly normal. But now, you see the methyl is starting to fatten out. And by the time you get up, so these guys are really, really lumped on top of each other. So by the time you get up, say, to bromohexane, where now these two protons, or three protons, are really, really, let's see, we've got alpha, beta, let's see, that's beta, okay. So now we end up with these guys really lumped on top of each other. And now you notice our triplet really is breaking down. And it doesn't look like a clean triplet. You could still call it an apparent triplet, but it's much uglier than you would expect. And this is exactly what I'm talking about for non-first non order behavior. You get up to bromooctane, and now you see it even more so. So this is what I'm talking about for non-first order due to overlap. So in other words, you have all of these guys in the chain overlapping with each other. And often what we will call this is virtual coupling. In other words, when hydrogens are overlapping, the methyl group is coupling to the adjacent methylene, but you can say, in effect, it's also coupling to these others down the chain because they're right on top of each other in chemical shift. And you'll see this effect. It's extremely pronounced. And you've already seen this before. Any of you who's seen a spectrum of THF has seen this behavior. Let me show you. Succinic acid. No problem. You're a singlet. You have four chemically equivalent protons in the chain. All four show up at the same chemical shift. They don't split each other. You go to glutaric acid, and you'd say, OK, 
even though, remember, none of this is a truly first order system, none of these compounds with chains are a first order system, you'd say, that doesn't look bad. It looks like what they taught me in sophomore chemistry. I see a triplet for the outer two CH2s, and I see a quintet for the inner one. Everything should be hunky-dory. Then you come to adipic acid and you say, what the heck is going on? And what the problem is, this business of virtual coupling, which is just one way to say it's a non-first order system, when you have these two methylenes right on top of each other, this methyl methylene group looks at it and it says, well, I'm coupled to one, but I'm virtually coupled to the other. And now these break down into non-simple patterns here. And it's reciprocal. So this one looks and it says, well, I'm coupled to this, but I have my neighbor and he's coupled to that. And we're all lumped together. And it's nothing about the length of the chain. It's all about this issue of overlap. So you go up from adipic acid to pamelic acid, one more carbon, and everything's back to being hunky-dory. In other words, you look at your outer methylenes, and they each look at their neighbors, and even though it's not a true first order system, they say, okay, we're fine. We're not overlapping. It'll behave largely like a first order system. And this is what I'm talking about, where you go ahead and you say, normally, you can get away with this sophomore level analysis. Normally, you can get away with treating things as first order or pseudo first order systems, but watch out because like this example and like our azulene example, we're really playing on thin ice. And as I said, these types of patterns come up again and again. So tetrahydrofuran has exactly the same principle as um, adipic acid. You have a methylene chain, you have this issue of virtual coupling, and so you have this hydrogen is virtually coupled, the one next to the oxygen is virtually coupled to the other two, and everything's reciprocal. And so you see this pattern here, and you see this pattern in other places. So we're very good as, as human beings at pattern recognition. And I've shown you three types, four types of patterns today. I've shown you the pattern of of a ortho disubstituted, symmetrically disubstituted aromatic, and we saw it for phthalic acid, for dioctyl phthalate, but you'd also see it for ortho dichlorobenzene or any other ortho compound. I showed you the distortion pattern for methyls that occurs. I've shown you the pattern that occurs in an extended methylene chain when it's locked in an anti conformation. And I've shown you this pattern that you get where you get virtual coupling in the middle of a chain. So keep those in mind because you will see them again in the course of your graduate career.